Coming up on Two and a Half Geeks, we're going to be talking about our favorite stuff from CES, entry level, extreme Sandy Bridge processors, and a contest, plus more. The bar has been set wicked fast. It rocked in the benchmarks. We're going to up the ante uh, a little bit. Processing power, I kind of understand this. Welcome back to Two and a Half Geeks. I'm Ayaz Akhtar alongside Dave Altavilla and Marco Cipetta, fresh off of our CES uh, I guess endeavor, our, tr our trip, our journey. Uh, how are you guys doing? I'm getting over a cold. This is my second day. I ought to be fine by tomorrow. <laughs> how are you guys? Yeah, man. Uh, Vegas and fresh when you leave usually don't in exist in the same sentence. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> so I don't know about fresh, but we're back. How about you, Marco? It was a good time. How'd you survive? I, I did pretty good, man. Before I left, I, I loaded myself up on the Airborne and the Emergency, and I keep uh, antibacterial wipes in my laptop bag, so I did not get sick, and uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Now, see, I'm pretty sure I did not get the CES plague. I got something from my preschool-bound son. He, I come uh, home, give him a hug, and he coughs in my mouth. Nice. Boom. That's not good. I get sick. <laughs> Kids that's got the wrong no. Place you know, to cough. Yeah, that's. I mean, like I, I staved off CES for so long, but you can't avoid a a child that goes to preschool, and thankfully no. they have nothing to do with hardware. Let's talk about our favorite stuff from CES. There was a just a whole lot of stuff out there. Like every show, I'm sure people complain about their feet hurting and booth appointments and enjoying the carpets of the Intel booth and the soon to be gone from this world Microsoft booth because they have the thick carpets. Dave. What was one of the what, what's some of the highlights for you? You know, certainly some of the the most striking things I saw. You know, the the OLED TVs Samsung and LG had on display were gorgeous, and God knows I was jonesing for one of those. A little too pricey for me right now, but it's nice to see the technology out there. Um, but really, what was near and dear to our hearts uh, certainly storage and OCC's um, suite at the Aria, the very swank Aria Hotel. They had some amazing technology on display. Uh, first thing they came out with was the Everest 2, which is the follow-on to uh, the Indolinx Everest SSD controller. Uh, so they have a new 6 gigabit per second SATA controller capable of about 550 megabytes a second read-write throughput. So about on par with the average Sandforce controller right now, but a little bit uh, more robust in terms of random IOPS. 90,000 random uh, IOPS. Uh, capable 105,000 read, 90,000 write, uh, random IOPS. And so, you know, a new controller coming out from OCZ's Indolinx division. Uh, nice to see that. Good to see them uh, continuing on with that technology. The Z Drive R5 with the Kilimanjaro uh, joint effort um, SSD controller between Marvell, joint effort between Marvell and OCZ. Um, that thing is their enterprise class uh, storage SSD controller. Uh, on the Z Drive R5 and the R4 RM1616, these are PCI Express by 16 uh, SSD, PCI Express SSDs. So, PCI Express by 16, ton of bandwidth over that edge connector. These things we saw were pushing um, in excess of 7 gigs a second. And <laughs> capable of two and a half million IOPS. So, um, just absolutely blistering fast, crazy, you know, data center heavy, you know, big iron kind of uh, horsepower. Uh, and uh, to go along with that, OCZ announced that they acquired a, a, a virtualization software company by the name of Sanrad that, you know, works with storage virtualization. So, nice fit there. Good to see lots of big things happening for OCZ. Then I would say um, certainly the folks at ASUS stepped out to impress with the Transformer Prime TF700T. That is the follow-on to the Transformer Prime we all know and love. It's got a gorgeous high-res 1920 by 1200 display now, same 10-inch uh, uh, display with a, a 1610 format, um, but super high-res, absolutely stunning. I mean, when you compare it to the regular Prime, you just... You go slack jaw. You know, I was there. You know, I had my geek drool coming out the corners of my mouth. So <laughs> it was uh, great to see. Um, same Tegra 3 under the hood. Uh, upgraded 2 megapixel uh, front facing camera on that. A little bit of an upgrade there. And sporting ice cream sandwich. 
Uh, very responsive uh, in terms of you know uh, just browsing around and multitasking with the new OS. And we're doing some testing on that right now. They also dropped it to the um, the original Prime. Uh, and then lastly, I would say Intel's announcement of their Medfield processor for smartphones was perhaps uh, a big showstopper for everybody, and it's something that we got briefed on prior to heading out to the show. So we kind of had a little inkling about it, and then um, you know they made the big announcement, which came with a bunch of design wins. Now, that's kind of like the cart before the horse almost. Usually we get briefed on the technology, and they say, oh, we can't talk about design wins. Well, Intel came out and said, here's the technology, and oh, by the way, Motorola, LG, Lenovo, a bunch of companies signed up. And they're announcing design ones that will roll out this year. Uh, it's single core Atom with hyper threading on board, and then a Power VR graphics core, which is what uh, TI uses on the OMAP uh, series, OMAP 4 series processors. Not bad. Wondering how that's going to shake out in terms of performance, but um, they talk about things like um, 1080p, 30 frames per second, video encode and decode capable on chip in hardware. Uh, it's going to be real exciting to see, especially how Motorola Mobility, right, now a division of Google, teams up with Intel to bring this thing to market. So some cool stuff. Now, before we go to Marco, I want to ask you guys, I want to put you guys on the spot. Do you guys think that Intel has finally cracked their power issue? The thing is their processors have always been very power hungry, and to actually get them to work in a smartphone, which already pushes the limits as when it comes to usage, do you guys think that this yeah. Medfield thing can handle it? Yeah, can, definitely. Can I that one? Go for it. Dave, can I jump in here? So I, jump, I definitely baby. think uh, in, Intel is, is going to be able to crack the market with Medfield. So you're talking about a, a 32 nanometer atom core. Um, not the same atom core that it's in netbooks. It's, you know, it's got more fine-grained uh, power gating, things like that. So you're looking at, you know, not a first effort for Intel, but a 32 nanometer chip that's in the ballpark with ARM cores. Um, Intel, their manufacturing prowess, though, is second to none. So you're going to see future generations of this chip, I think, surpass the power capabilities of, of you know current SOCs based on ARM stuff. So, yeah, I think Intel is on the right track, and I think they're going to make a, a lot of noise. Maybe not as much noise with Medfield as they want. There's going to be some, but the, the follow-on and the follow-on to that, I think Intel is going to make serious inroads. You know, and, and uh, just to, to touch on that I, I, as well, Mark, I, I, I totally agree. I think they are. I think, you know, in, especially in the mobile space, Intel is a newcomer. They certainly have to earn their stripes, and you're just not going to pull down design wins uh, unless you've really got the stuff. And these guys have seen this chip. They've probably had it in the lab for months and months and months now uh, for Intel to be able to go out and say, you know, they're announcing design wins with these big-name companies. So, um, you know, whereas Morristown, the previous gen effort that Intel made in this space, uh, fell flat on its face pretty much, uh, it looks like Medfield is chalking up design wins left and right, and Intel's already announced those companies. So that's, I think, I think the traction's already there. How about you, Marco? What were your highlights? What are the ones that stood out to you? Um, quite a few things stood out for me. Um, one of the things that we didn't get to see at this show, but Samsung announced, which I'm fairly excited for, is the uh, Galaxy S2 Skyrocket HD. So they haven't really specs, so I'm not exactly clear what kind of hardware is in it, but I'm assuming it's going to be a uh, LTE phone for AT&T's network, which was wicked fast out in Vegas when it worked. I was pulling 30 meg down and 13 up when I was in an LTE area on my regular Skyrocket. But um, I'm assuming it's similar specs to the current Skyrocket, but with a uh, 1280 by 720 uh, true HD screen. Um, I'd be really psyched to check that out. I also thought the Galaxy Note, which they were showing, was pretty cool. You know, I, I liked browsing on that, what is it? I think it's a 5.3 inch form factor. It's definitely too big to be a phone. It's definitely, you know, it, it has phone functionality, but way too chunky, way too beefy. Um, Another really cool thing we saw at the show, probably for a, a PC geek, the hottest thing at the show, in my opinion, was the uh, Lenovo Yoga Ultrabook. Did you get to see that, IS? I, I didn't get to see it in person, but we did discuss it a lot, and I'd seen it in pictures and videos. It's got that really interesting hinge. Yeah, so I, I got my hands on it, and it's, it's got what's known as a dual articulating hinge. So it's an Ultrabook form factor. 
The screen opens up like any other Ultrabook, but there's basically a, a second hinge on there so you can flip the screen all the way back and use it as a stand or close it completely and have a true tablet form factor. And it'll actually shut off the keyboard so you don't have to worry about holding the back of the machine. Ten finger multi-touch, tons of cool features. That is going to be a hot Ultrabook when it ships. Yeah, and of, uh, the last... Oh, go ahead. I was saying a lot, of, a lot of the complaints about that Lenovo Yoga uh, notebook was when you place it down in that tablet uh, form factor that the keyboard could get mucked up. I don't know if they... If you saw it in person, did, did you notice any like feet or anything to keep the tablet off the table slightly when you put it into the so, tablet mode? Sort of. There's no feet on it, but the keyboard is slightly recessed. Uh -huh. And although they haven't disclosed it because they're not done with testing, uh, they told me that the keyboard has been tested with a three ounce spill. So even if like you did get some liquid in there, or it, it can, should be able to drain up to three ounces of liquid if something got in there. So cleaning it shouldn't be a problem. Laying it flat shouldn't be a problem because it is slightly recessed. And if the screen is flipped to the tablet form factor and you're holding it, you don't have to worry about hitting any keys because the keyboard is going to get shut off. And there was one more thing you seemed, you seemed like you wanted to say before I, I was questioning about yeah, the Yeah, and the, the, actually the, the third um, really cool demo that we saw, we uh, stopped by AMD's booth, and they had a 17-watt quad-core uh, Trinity APU running in a ultra-slim notebook. So what's cool about Trinity, you know, everybody knows Bulldozer didn't quite perform uh, like everybody expected. Trinity uses pile driver cores which, if what AMD said is true, they're going to offer 10 to 15% improvement uh, in IPC. Who knows what kind of clocks we're going to get. Plus, the core has a second-generation DX11 graphics processor on board. So you end up with what's going to be a really nice quad-core with probably really nice DX11 graphics in a 17-watt mobile chip. That's, it still impresses me that 17 watts, you get a light bulb, a tiny light bulb is 40 watts. But a 17-watt chip can power a whole PC. I, I think it's going to be cool. Yeah, for me, the coolest things I got to see were really... I didn't get to see a whole lot of the show floor. But obviously, the, the OLED televisions from LG looked fantastic. I still think it's a really yeah. niche kind of thing. It's 8000 bucks for a 55-inch display. It's, good, it's a good idea for the future. I'm thinking three to five years from now, it'll be nice yeah. that these are being produced and at a low cost. But for me, right now, at 8000 bucks for only 55 inches, you can get yourself a better projector. You can get yourself a 55 inch television for under 2000 bucks these days. And that's if you want thin, that's the other thing. So I, I liked where it was going, not so much as where it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I also really liked that new transformer with the 1900 by 1200 display, which I think they designated the TF 700, not a good name. They could have called it the HD or something, <laughs> but I was fascinated by this concept because for me, this might be almost perfect for around the house. It's a tablet most of the time when you want it to be. When you want to type, you have the dock, and that display is capable of doing multitasking. That kind of thing, I could really get my hands on and enjoy that. And the price point's still really low. And yeah. I heard they fixed the whole GPS issue by switching the plastic on the back uh, instead of the metal. It wasn't as cool as looking, but functionality over prettiness, I'll take that. And lastly, a very odd thing, MSI had a dumb box that you could, you could put a PCIe graphics card into, and then yep. it attached to a Thunderbolt port. Now, it's not working yet because there's no, the software drivers for Windows 7 aren't there yet. But for me, because I know where all laptops are going, I think Ultrabooks really are where they're going to go. Uh, external graphics standards just thrill me. Because Ultrabooks, okay, fine. Yeah, I know Intel says, yeah, we can handle all your processing and your graphics. We can do that. Don't worry about that. But when you want to do some serious stuff, you need an external graphics card. And so that's one of the things I'm really excited about. I don't know, I'm, do you guys get to see that, the MSI device? Yes, we, we did, and, and that, yeah. that's actually... I actually have a, good... a funny story with that, but go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I, I was just saying that it was... I, I'm impressed that IS picked up on that technology and, and uh, found it fascinating because, um, yeah, I thought, too, it was one of the most innovative things we've seen, uh, you know, in terms of making use of that high bandwidth um, connection with Thunderbolt. Yeah, that thing is actually, it was called the Gus 2. We have, uh, we have some pics of it up on the site. Um, in our conversations with MSI about that, I gave them two good ideas to revise it for the next version. And if they use those ideas, MSI owes me two dinners. So we'll see what happens. So one of the big things we saw at CES, lots and lots of Ultrabooks, right? Everybody has an Ultrabook. Intel wants you to buy an Ultrabook. 
But Dave, you guys got to review another ultra book, the Toshiba Portage, which I always wanted to call Protege. Not correct. Yes. Uh, with the model number, again, you'll never forget it. The Z835 hyphen P330. It's catchy. <laughs> It's catchy. How is the actual notebook? For, forget my little name uh, making fun of thing here. Yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> it, yeah, not the catchiest name. And uh, I want to say protege, too. And I think they intentionally made that little play on words there. Um, but it is the second ultra book we've actually taken a look at. We took, uh, took a look at Asus's uh, Zen book series, the UX21. Uh, and um, this fortunately dropped in at a much lower price point. We're actually seeing the the notebook we tested, the Z uh, eight thirty five P three thirty street price is seven ninety nine as configured as as was tested uh, in our labs. And um, you know, uh, quality machine for sure. I mean, Toshiba does a real nice job with things like the display. The design is super thin. It weighs two point four seven pounds. Um, has a, a really nice, you know, um, uh, four gig, you know, can, uh, I should say installation, uh, four gig DDR3 1333 with uh, Core i3 2367M mobile processor, Windows 7 uh, premium, uh, Windows Home uh, premium 64 bit. And so, you know, good configuration, good setup, a little bit lacking in spots, especially when you compare it to uh, the likes of the ZenBook. Um, the the display the the lid was a little flimsy uh, keyboard a little bit cramped a uh, little bit tighter viewing angles on the display versus uh, the Asus and um, also that the SSD on board was definitely not even nearly as snappy as the Asus ZenBook uh, Toshiba obviously a big manufacturer of NAND flash technologies that's how they I think that's how they drove some of the cost out of their machine was to uh, just get some lower cost uh, NAND flash into this thing and and as a result it didn't quite perform uh, near uh, as well as the uh, to uh, the ASUS excuse me uh, SSD that they had in their machine so um, at any rate um, what uh, we expected to see in the lab wasn't quite uh, what um, we got uh, in terms of uh, performance, but uh, all in all, a solid machine. We gave it an approved rating. Um, certainly a, a good effort for the price, and we'd like to see uh, more manufacturers getting down to that price point in the uh, in the ultrabook space. All right, Dave. Intel's so behind, you know, the, the whole ultrabook push. The thing is, they seem to vary in quality a lot. You talked you talked really nicely about the ZenBook and the. the the Toshiba one seems like it's kind of chintzy with the slow SSD, and it, the build quality seems lousy. I mean, isn't this going to sour people on Ultrabooks if they don't have a consistent kind of experience? You know, that's an interesting question, and I, I wouldn't necessarily call this, uh, you know, the Toshiba uh, protege at all uh, chintzy. It, you know, the build quality was there, felt a little bit more flimsy. We were spoiled, uh, if you will, by the uh, Asus ZenBook experience and and its uh, brushed aluminum exterior that. Uh, just you know, really super striking and and really well built. Uh, this wasn't quite as well built, but we wouldn't say it was chintzy. It just felt a little flimsy in the lid area. Um, but I would say, yeah, you know, Intel certainly when they you know went to to the manufacturers with this you know marketing term, if you will, um, you know they had a vision in mind, and I think uh, a lot of the manufacturers as well. When when you hear the word ultra in, in uh, you know, a brand name, um, you know, they're thinking quality as well. But you are going to get varying degrees of quality depending on the manufacturer, depending on the, the build and how much you spend for it. And not every Ultrabook, as we've come to find out, uh, is created equal. And in this case, you know, a very different storage subsystem uh, performance experience uh, in this in this Ultrabook and, uh, you know, different different type of build quality. Uh, you, conversely, you save a couple three hundred dollars uh, looking at this machine versus what Asus put forth uh, in their first effort. So you know it's just one of those things. But yeah, it's it's a marketing term for sure, and it's not something that was cast in stone. And so there's a there's a bit of gray area between the manufacturers that uh, you know will come out in different model types. Well, speaking of low prices, let's talk about the Intel Core i7 3820 quad core Sandy Bridge E. When the E stands for entry level, apparently. Apparently, Marco, can you tell us a little bit about this processor? Is the E entry level? Is it extreme? Is it enough? I don't know. Are there E words? <laughs> e enough? So it's a uh, it's an interesting chip. So the the 
Core i7-3820 is based on the Sandy Bridge E-Core, the Sandy Bridge Extreme Core. So at its heart, technically, is a die that has eight cores on there. But four of those cores are disabled. So in the high-end 3960X, two cores are disabled. That's a six-core chip that can process 12 threads. This is a quad-core chip that can process eight threads um, with 10 megs of cache, a gig of, I'm sorry, one meg of L2. Uh, clock speeds are similar to 3960. You're talking a, a, well, actually a little higher base clock, 3.6 base clock with a turbo up to 3.9. So as far as quad-core chips go, um, it's right on par with Intel's regular Sandy Bridge Core i7-2700. Um, however, this the 3820 requires the LGA 2011 socket, so you'll need an X79 motherboard to get the most performance. It requires quad-channel memory, um, a different cooler, all that good stuff that, that the X79 requires. Um, but you end up with Intel's most cutting-edge platform, but with a sub-$300 CPU uh, that can process up to eight threads. Kind of a, a funky platform because you could save some money and go with a... Uh, you know, like a Z68 and a 2700K and get similar CPU performance, but not quite as cutting edge of a platform. Now, the E-Series is still the last step before we get to Ivory Bridge, right? Is there a real reason to move to, a, I guess, a motherboard that has the socket, which I'm going to assume can handle Ivory Bridge? I would assume that's the point of E. Is there, like, is there a, real, a real push to move to this right now? Or do you think, you know what, I'll stick to pre-E and it's fine for now? <laughs> so it's it's funny the the 2011 socket there's no confirmation yet should support ivy bridge chips but the high-end ivy bridges um i forget their particular code name um but those aren't going to come until late next year the first batch of ivy bridge chips are going to use the socket uh, 1155 the same ones that the you know the core i7 2700k uses there'll be new chipsets we actually showed some of the motherboards the uh the uh I think there's Z77 chipset motherboards from CES that'll be for Ivy Bridge. Um, you know, it's a tough call to say if somebody should jump to this platform. You end up with, let's say it's a hundred dollar price difference between a uh, you know a Core i7 2700K base system and a 3820 base system. What you get with the 3820 and the X79 is um, much more PCI Express connectivity. There's 40 integrated lanes of up to PCIe three speeds. Um, with the 3820. Um, you also end up with a quad-channel memory controller, so gobs of, of memory bandwidth. So if, if you're doing something that could take advantage of all that bandwidth, you will get better performance. And also for multi-GPU setups, those extra PCIe lanes means you can get true by 16 connectivity. Now that's all like little incremental improvements depending on the apps or if you're running mainstream apps. You know, but some enthusiasts want that. The chips also... It's, it's not an extreme edition, so it's not fully unlocked, but it's highly overclockable. The X79 chipset has an extra uh, FSB strap or base clock strap, so you can very quickly and easily, like I, I took this chip on it with an air cooler up to 4.7 gigahertz with a few minutes of tweaking. So it's a real enthusiast class chip on an enthusiast class platform. It's not perfect, but it would make for a killer system. On to contest, contest rumblings. Dave, <laughs> is there anything going on in the labs of hot hardware or the, the vendors giving you some stuff you can give away or anything you can tell us just yet? Rumble, rumble, yes. We actually have a contest going right now where you could win the components to make a killer system, actually. Um, so, uh, yeah, actually, uh, we've got uh, Gigabyte sponsoring the uh, New Year's giveaway. So, hot hardware, Gigabyte New Year's giveaway. And we've got... Uh, Three prizes currently up for grabs. You've got a Gigabyte uh, GeForce GTX 560 graphics card. That's a nice uh, mid to high end uh, graphics card. Uh, really nice, uh, you know, cooler and fan. Nice uh, large fan uh, sync combination on that uh, card. So nice and quiet. Uh, you also, for the second uh, runner up, you have the ability to win a Gigabyte Z68 XP UD3P motherboard. Element OP, Alphabet Soup. Um, it, is, uh, it is a nice uh, Z68-based motherboard uh, where you can um, uh, you know, start the base of uh, a killer gaming rig with that. And uh, the third prize, 
Uh, the second runner-up uh, would receive a Force K3 keyboard and M6900 mouse, also by Gigabyte. Uh, so some gaming uh, peripheral gear to, uh, to round out uh, your system. So some pretty cool stuff up for grabs, and that is this month, the uh, New Year's giveaway. And, of course, all the details about this contest are available at hothardware.com. And basically, if you want to know anything we were talking about, you're like, hey, I want to know about that Prime, tra that Transformer Prime with the weird model number TF700T. Or you want to know about the Samsung Galaxy S2 Skyrocket. It's on hothardware.com. Or you can go around the web to facebook.com slash hothardware, dig.com slash hothardware, twitter.com slash hothardware, or youtube.com slash hothardwarevids. So you guys, by the way, were avoiding me at CES. Admit it. Admit no. It. We did not get to meet no, up this no. year, unfortunately, uh, due to all kinds of crazy commitments. Because CES I know CES was a cluster this year. We'll, we'll leave it at the madhouse. It's so many different hotels these days. They don't even just stay on the show floor. I'm assuming you guys no. had a lot of uh, vendor meetings at the Aria, so to speak, and other places. Aria and Venetian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah a lot of those. And I was, I was, I was at the Twit stage, uh, being a Twit. So we we should have come seen you. Where was the Twitch stage? We were in South Hall, Lower South Hall, uh, right by the FedEx office uh, thing. So we're <laughs> wow. always there. We'll be there next year. And then next year, I'll say when you come over to the booth, I'll say thanks for stopping by. Hey, Marco, what is new with you? Chicka chicka boom boom. Will there be enough room? Exactly. Wow. 